Hi, I'm Donna Hanover. Science and You starts now. I'm Mike Gilliam. Coming up on Science and You, memory. Are you going to lose it just because you're getting a little bit older? Well, we'll take a look at that question in just a minute. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We sleep, we dream, but how much do we really understand about what our brains are doing each night? That's ahead on Science and You. Hi, I'm Ernabelle DeMillo. So what's bugging you? Is it one-sided cell phone conversations? Or what about someone texting while walking? What about all the noise and traffic in the city? Well, coming up on Science and You, I'm going to investigate the science behind what bugs us. Or is that just annoying? I'm Donna Hanover. What is it in our brains that causes us to smile? And is a fake smile necessarily bad? We've come here to Yale University to find out what's really happening when we show our pearly whites. Ahead on Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell. They're neuroscientists by day and rockers by night. Meet the amygdaloids, ahead on Science and You. Have you ever uttered the phrase, my memory is bad, I must be getting older? Well, it's probably something that's going to happen to all of us at some point. But is that something we have to resign us to, that we're gonna lose memory as we age? Is it normal? Let's go see if we can find some answers. Have you ever seen these people who are memory experts? This is Ron White, considered one of the world's foremost memory experts. Here, the two-time national memory champion is showing he can remember the names of every person in this room, even though he has met them just once. He gives their name, they sit. But most of us can't do that. Sometimes it's tough to remember what you had for dinner last week. But is that just the result of normal aging? Dr. James Galvin, a professor of neurology and psychology at NYU Langone Medical Center in Manhattan and an expert on memory and memory problems, doesn't think so. Memory loss, that is true forgetfulness, uh, is never part of the normal aging process and would suggest that something is causing it. Uh, so some disorder or disease is leading to the problems with memory. Galvin says memory should stay intact well into a person's 10th decade of life and that there are two basic types of memory, short and long term. Short term memory is I have to give you a piece of information, you have to listen to the information, you have to learn the information, then it has to be stored somewhere and then you have to be able to retrieve it. Galvin says once it's stored, the information shifts to long term memory after about 15 minutes. That does require some restructuring of the brain so the information has its place and can be retrieved. He says long-term memory typically isn't affected by most things. That's why you can remember a friend's phone number from 30 years ago. So why do people have trouble remembering? Galvin says there are certain things you have to do to have an effective memory. The first thing to making a memory is paying attention. And so attention, even though it's not directly part of memory is critical. If someone is distracted, if someone's under a lot of stress, if someone's multitasking, um, or if someone just doesn't feel what they're hearing is that important, they're going to pay less attention to it. If you don't attend to something, you have no chance of remembering it. According to Galvin, the first thing the brain does is encode the information. And so a, a defect in attention, in coding, in storage, or in retrieval will manifest itself as a problem with memory. But the causes of each of those different steps can be quite different. And that's where you get into health problems that could cause memory loss, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. So if you suddenly feel you're having increased memory loss, what do you do? If you are noticing a change in your memory, the first thing you should do is speak with your doctor, because it's important to know what the cause of that change is. It may be the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease, or it may be some other disease which can be treatable. 
There are also some things we can all do to keep the brain strong or slow down any memory problems we might have. Keeping your mind active, uh, reading, going to museums, going to plays, playing games, chess, checkers, backgammon, doing crossword puzzles. In large studies of people who do these things, there appears to be about a 30 to 40 percent risk reduction uh, in terms of developing memory problems and keeping your brain active and sharp, even if you have a mild memory problem, may help slow down some of the process. But how do you get from where you are to this? And then right here, this is Kate, and next to Kate is Yvette. One way is to use a strategy called linking. The way you link it is you take the information that you need to learn and you attach it to something you already know. So if you have to remember a person's name and you were introduced by your that person by your cousin, you know your cousin, you link that person to your cousin, you're not going to forget your cousin, you can then remember that person's name. Another thing you can do to help yourself is use the technology that you have at your fingertips. You have a smartphone, use it to take notes. Put in the name of the maitre d' at the restaurant so you can get that good table when you want one. Or the manager at the local store that you might need to know and you can't really remember, put it in the smartphone. And then when you need it, just call it up. Another thing you have to do is take care of yourself. So I think that four things that everybody could do to help maintain their brain health are to stay physically active, mentally active, socially engaged, and eat a healthy and balanced diet. All of those things that we know are heart healthy behaviors are also brain healthy behaviors. And we can add to that, work on your memory by paying greater attention and by simply trying to remember. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Over the course of our lives, most of us will spend years, maybe even decades, sleeping and dreaming. Today we take a closer look at what our brains are doing during all of that time. By day, Nicole Page is an entertainment attorney, but when she sleeps, her dreams can take her far beyond the boundaries of law. The dictionary defines a dream this way, a series of thoughts, images, or emotions occurring during sleep. For Nicole, dreams can be meaningful, so she writes down what she remembers in a notebook kept right by her bed. On occasion, I remember my dreams, and when I do, they are vivid. In what ways? Well, I, I find that when I remember my dreams, it's because there's something in, in my life that's going on that I'm not kind of dealing with on a conscious level, and my dream is, is telling me, wake up and listen, it's staggering to consider just how much time we spend asleep. Dr. William Fishbein, a neuroscientist and professor at City College, explains the math. If you live to be 75 and sleep on average eight hours a day, over a lifetime you'd expect to spend about 25 years asleep. On average, about, um, about 25 years of life is spent asleep, and then that raises the question. And that question centers around what is the function of those 25 years for the other 50 years? And though we all know a good night's rest helps us function better during the day, there's much more to sleeping and dreaming than we may realize. There are numerous neurobiological changes that are going on during sleep. It is not a, a passive period, um, but rather it's a very active period in which the brain is, a, is, is actively engaged in processing all sorts of information. Dr. Fishbein says the slow wave stage of sleep seems to be particularly important for acquiring and consuming consolidating specific kinds of new information. For example, learning a fact such as the capital of France is Paris. The rapid eye movement stage of sleep, often associated with dreams, appears more related to processing emotional information and specifically memories that have some upsetting emotional aspect associated with them. Are dreams essentially memories that we are just not accessing during the rest of our waking Time? Absolutely. Um, obviously, um, just as we do in daydreaming, what we're doing is we are conjuring up uh, experiences that we had uh, from the past. But what, if anything, do dreams really mean? It's a matter of debate and depends who you talk to. Lauren Lawrence, a psychoanalyst by training, is the dreams columnist for the New York Daily News and the star of Celebrity Nightmares Decoded. She says dreams can make us more self-aware, if we let them. I say the worse the dream, the better. 
And that is because, especially nightmares, because it's really, really allowing your inside to come out, your psyche. And everything you, that's terrifying you or giving you anxiety, you can then work on. Can I tell you about one of my dreams and see sure. what you think? Is sure. that all right? Sure. So I'm driving a car with the kids in the back, but the incline is so steep that I'm terrified the car is going to topple backwards. And then as we get to the top, the car does start to topple backwards, topple backwards, and I can't control it. Well, first of all, it shows uh, being in the driver's seat means that you're in control. And um, going up a steep hill means that there is difficulty at some point in your life at that moment that you had the dream. But it could be something minor. It could be just working very hard to get over some hump, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then there's always the fear of, you make progress in life and there's always the fear of, you know, slipping Sliding back down. down. Exactly. So there's a little bit of that in it. Whether you believe in the meaning of your dreams is obviously a personal choice, but it's clear sleep is crucial to our survival and potentially a part of how we hold on to information. When we learn something and, um, and that information gets consolidated before we fall asleep, once we are asleep, the information gets replayed and that replaying may facilitate this permanent storage. Given how much time we all spend snoozing, learning more about sleep and what it means for our waking lives is certainly something to think about. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. Hi, I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Science and You. New York City, one of the most populous cities in the world, with more than 8 million people living in this tiny island, and that's not including tourists, I'm sure there are plenty of things that annoy us. But what if I told you that there may be a science behind what bugs us? Well, I met two authors who decided to investigate. Flora Lickman is annoyed. I'm perpetually annoyed. I'm one of those people that sort of gets annoyed by little things. And I had a moment on the subway here in New York. I was going, I think, from Midtown, where I work, to um, Brooklyn, where I live. And about one stop in, a guy sits next to me and he pulls out a nail clippers. And I was hopeful at first that maybe he just wanted to do one nail, but it turns out he wanted to do them all very meticulously. So it was, it was like 30 minutes of nail clipping. And I felt myself having, sort of getting more and more annoyed. And I had this, you know, emotional, physical reaction. My blood pressure is going up, um, starting to sweat. And then I wondered, why do I care? She cared enough to write a book with her co-worker, National Public Radio's Joe Palka. Together they wrote Annoying, the Science of What Bugs Us. The pair interviewed dozens of scientists and researchers to get to the bottom of annoyances. They cover everything from why traffic makes our blood pressure go up to annoying spouses. So why is the sound of nails on a chalkboard, for instance, so annoying? Well, scientists may have found the answer. This sound has the same frequency as a human scream. There are acousticians who've tried to look at the, uh, the, the signature, the acoustic signature of fingernails on a blackboard. One of its qualities is that it's rough, which means it's varying in amplitude, even though it might be similar in, in frequency. So it's getting loud and soft, loud and soft, loud and soft in a very rapid way. And that roughness is called, tends to be unpleasant to people. But the idea that someone looked at it and compared that signature with a human scream in terms of frequency and power, wow, I thought that's really interesting. Because where does that come from? How, did, how does it happen that that sound or styrofoam rubbing together is like, it's, it causes a physical response. What bugs us is subjective, but the authors found several annoyances that are universal. For instance, why do most of us find it annoying when people are talking on their cell phone, when all we want to do is read our books on the train or eat dinner quietly with friends? We found that there may be a biological component. You know, I think most people think, oh, it's rude. And that's why it's annoying to us. But it turns out that researchers have looked at this question, and there's something about hearing half of a conversation that's particularly annoying. And linguists will tell you that what we're doing when we're talking, in fact, what your brain is doing right now when you're listening to me talk, is trying to finish the end of my sentence. And when you only hear half of a conversation, it becomes very difficult to predict the end of the sentence. and that 
then sort of draws us in more and we get more distracted and more tuned into that conversation and you know we'd rather be reading our book or whatever um, and that seems to be part of why cell phone conversations are so so annoying and while there are certainly universal annoyances some are also cultural here especially in new york you have people from all different kinds of cultures right. so something that could annoy new yorkers may not necessarily annoy someone from another country and vice versa. Right. No, I think this is I think there's a lot of annoyance potential in New York particularly. Um, in fact, we we looked at this little study of Japan subway train riders and what annoys the Japanese commuters is pretty different I think from what annoys American riders. So, in Japan, t top annoyances included like putting on your makeup in the subway or slouching in your seat, or taking up a little too much room. The authors found that a majority of annoyances do have factors in common. First, it has to be unpredictable, like traffic. It has to be unpleasant, like a buzzing mosquito or a whining child. And finally, one must wonder when will it end. Palco was late for our interview because of an annoyingly delayed train. We stuck here for five minutes? Okay, who cares? 10 minutes? Okay, who cares? 20 minutes? I'm beginning to care. 30 minutes? Yeah, now I really care. So, is there something we can learn from all this? Will knowing why we are annoyed help us be less annoyed? One thing is that you can kind of change your, your point of view. So if you expect life to be pretty annoying and then it is, you know, you might get less of a reaction. So what have I learned after reading this book? Well, I've learned, I think, to be less annoying. But then again, annoying people don't realize they're annoying. And that's annoying. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. There are 43 major muscles in your face. Which ones does your brain fire up when you smile? Well, that depends on whether it's a genuine smile that comes from happy feelings or a deliberate one designed to accomplish something. Yale psychology professor Dr. Marianne LaFrance has studied facial expressions for many years. There are two muscles involved in the spontaneous smile. One muscle involves the mouth corners, which brings them up and out an oblique angle. That's called the zygomaticus muscle. The other muscle, which is the really intriguing one, is one that circumferences the eye socket. That's called the obicularis oculi. When there is a spontaneous, genuine smile, this muscle contracts as does this one simultaneously. The difference is, while most people can do this one deliberately, this is very hard to do deliberately. Ergo, that's the sign of the genuine smile. The genuine smile is often called a Duchenne smile because it was first described by French scientist Guillaume Duchenne in the mid-19th century. Dr. LaFrance says genuine smiles often come in short bursts, while deliberate or intentional smiles tend to stay on the face longer. And deliberate smiles also tend to be asymmetrical. This is classic asymmetrical. You can see that it's much bigger on this side of his face than than on this side of the face. So this is very deliberate. Um, it's a straight on, I've been asked to do this. Is a deliberate smile necessarily a fake or bad smile? It basically says, I recognize you, I'm gonna be cooperative, please see me as a decent human being, I'm decent, you're decent, we can get along here. How does the brain operate to create either a genuine smile or a deliberate smile? It wasn't until people started to study people with various brain damage locations that there are two neural pathways that get smiles to the face. So for example, there are some people who can smile deliberately. You say smile, it, out it comes, it's fine. But even when they're delighted, even when they're as happy as can be, they cannot show a smile. Are we talking about specific areas in the brain? No, it's really a pathway that goes from the muscles through a the whole neural system. So it's not a particular location in the brain. It is literally a pathway, a circuit of firings that, that are connected with different smile types. Do women smile more than men? Girls and women smile significantly more often with more intense, bigger smiles. In fact, one of Dr. LaFrance's grad students, Jacqueline Smith, is doing research about the facial expressions we expect from women as opposed to men. Basically, we're having um, 
participants do a series of reaction time tasks, and we show them faces of men and women that are either happy, angry, or neutral. And they have to identify the face, either the gender on the face or the emotion on the face. Um, and we measure how quickly they do this. Um, so their reaction times are always less than a second, very fast. But what we find is that people tend to identify uh, women faster when they're happy and men faster when they're angry. So you're coming to the conclusion that people expect a woman to smile more than they expect a man to smile. Exactly. Different cultures also have different attitudes towards smiling. In most other parts of the world, especially northern European countries, they cannot get over how much Americans smile. It seems to them sort of dopey uh, because Americans will smile at strangers. And for, say, uh, Russians or the French, they think, why would you ever smile at a stranger? That's intrusive. That, that's impolite. You reserve the smile for people that you care about and that you know and you trust. In her book, Lip Service, Dr. LaFrance says when we see a smile, we often experience a halo effect. We know that there are reward centers in the brain that are activated when people see a smile. In fact, a lot of smiles that we see on a day-to-day -day basis are less than a second, sometimes as much as a thirtieth of a second, tenth of a second. What people know only is a feeling that something got a little rosier, something's a little brighter, but damned if they can tell where it came from. Is the sparkle we see in the eyes of someone who is genuinely smiling real or imagined? What sometimes happens with a genuine smile, what people say is uh, brought a sparkle to her eyes, is the viscosity um, around the eyeball has gotten actually a little thicker, which causes more light refraction, which causes people to think that they really have a sparkle in their eye, which actually they, she does. So all in all, big, genuine, positive smile. So smiling is a significant signaling system that our brains use to consciously or unconsciously tell other people what we think and how we feel. Sometimes there's a glitch based on gender or cultural differences, but in general, smiling works pretty well. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell. A lot of pop music is written about the heart. Meet a band that sings about the brain. Mind Joseph Ledoux. I'm a professor of neuroscience at NYU. Um, I run something called the Ledoux Laboratory. In the Ledoux Lab, we study emotion, memory, and the brain. Dr. Ledoux is also author of the best-selling book, The Emotional Brain, still in print after 15 years. But today, we're here to talk to Joe Ledoux, rock and roll star. I'm also the lead singer and guitar player in the amygdaloids. Named after the almond-shaped part of the brain he studies at Ledoux Labs. The amygdala is a key structure. It detects danger and produces hardwired protective responses. The amygdala also forms emotional memories. It uses these to predict harm in the future. Today we're listening in as Joe and members of the Amygdaloids, Amanda Thorpe on bass and Daniela Schiller on drums, rehearse songs for their upcoming EP, Map of Your Mind. Their music has been described as heavy mental because like their previous albums, all the music is based on themes about mind and brain and mental disorders. The way I describe my songs is songs about life and love with uh, nuggets of information about mind and brain thrown in. The video fearing was directed by Noah Hutton. Uh, we did it in a barn upstate. While I was fearing in came. The lyrics come from a poem by Emily Dickinson, which I used, uh, modified a bit to make it work more as a song. He's not forgetting It's vivid rehearsal of pain It reminds me of that day It keeps fear in my brain It's vivid rehearsal of pain and, uh, She apparently had you know, some problems and so she uh, gives us a kind of clinical case study of her fears and anxieties. It's not about actually encountering the dangerous thing, it's just waiting for it. It keeps fear in my I just started actually my own lab in Mount Sinai and I'm interested in learning uh, how um, fear is represented in the brain, how we overcome fear uh, in humans. By uh, understanding fear, we hope to understand 
other emotions. And you've pushed the envelope of fear because you're a skydiver. Does it ever get easier when you're free falling? Never. It actually gets worse. The easiest jump is the first one. Because Why? Uh, well, afterward, you really know what you're going into, and it, it just gets scarier and scarier. Um, it's a song, Mind Over Matter, that we have the good fortune to have Brooke Cash sing with me on. Mind Over Matter It's something I'm trying to do I guess it's only physics That keeps me apart from you you know, it's more of a ballad and a song about uh, wanting to connect with someone who's no longer with you for whatever reason uh, and then pull that person back into your mind, not obviously into your physical presence, but into your mind. So class, what have we learned today? Fear, rage, and love. It's not every day you meet a neuroscientist who clinically studies emotions and writes songs about them. So I had to ask, we can identify them, but we right. can't control them. Why? Well, we're at a point right now where the emotional brain and the cognitive brain are not quite in sync. The cortex is necessary to control your emotions. So the amygdala, once aroused, is very difficult to turn off by the cortex. We don't want to be Mr. Spock, where you know, we have total control over every emotional nuance. We don't want that. Why don't we want to be Mr. Spock? Because our emotions uh, make our life worth living, and if we're totally in control, we have no surprise, no uh, uh, nothing to look forward to. It's just all predictable. And we have no music? No music, definitely no music. For more information, we go to... AmigDeloids.com. And I'm Barry Mitchell. You're watching Science and You. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Donna Hanover. See you next time on Science and You.